invite you to uh, have your scripture out in front of you as we turn to God's Word together. Um, there are Bibles underneath the pew in which you're sitting in. Of course, it is on the screen and inside your bulletin as well. We have two New, new Testament letters as our passages today. Romans 12, 1-8, and 1 Corinthians 12, 12-27. Hear now God's Word, beginning with Romans 12, 1-8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. In First Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lack it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ, and individually members of it. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you as, as we've been in this series on the Holy Spirit that you have offered many, many prayer requests and we have been praying. And one of the things, and so you have prayer cards in your pews. I want you to fill those out. I want you to submit more prayer requests. Uh, one of the things that um, many of you suggested we pray for, uh, all of the victims of Hurricane Helene, and you've probably seen images like this, um, just, it's just terrible. And so we need to be in prayer for all of those folks, many poor folks in rural areas, North Carolina and Tennessee. Let's lift them up. And then I, I want to point out that another major thing happening in the world, um, tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of the horrible Hamas attack in Israel. And uh, last Sunday, I had the privilege of being at Chabad House, which is the Orthodox uh, Jewish Center of Worship, just down the street. And uh, Michael Rappaport came and spoke. And he's, he's an actor and comedian, and you may have heard of him, you may not have, but he has been very outspoken and courageous in his support of Israel. He's been to Israel four times the last year, um, and, and, and he's seen some of the houses where some of these terrible things uh, took place. 
And we are uh, up on one year, and there are still, at least uh, the latest that I saw, 101 hostages. Seven of them Americans. And in our country, somehow, anti-Semitism has risen again. It's ugly faith. And Christians, we ought to be appalled by this, and we ought to um, oppose it because uh, we're all made in the image of God. And, um, you know, Paul writes about the, the Jews in Romans 9, and you know what he says? He says, I wish that I were damned so that my brothers and sisters would know Jesus. So, if you know Jewish, like, it, it was very, it meant a lot to this congregation. I didn't know, I, I was invited by a friend named Alan, and we went, and they announced me there and clapped that I was there. I think because as a Christian pastor, it was helpful for them to have uh, other people outside the Jewish people care about uh, the Jewish people. So we ought to we ought to be um, hopeful that every Jewish person comes to know Jesus, because the Messiah has come, and we ought to love them and care for them and be friends with with, with them, pointing them to Jesus just like anybody else. Um, that, that's what that's what Paul said, and, and we ought to follow what what the Word of God tells us. And yes, we don't want anybody to die. We want there to be peace. But when there's one organization defined and originates out of a desire to destroy a nation and an ethnic group, that's bad. And we ought not to equivocate on that. So we, we should pray. And uh, may the Lord bring these hostages back. Um, we're going to pray now, and we're going to pray for those two things, and then pray that the Lord sends us through it. Father, we pray for all of the people who have been affected by Hurricane Helene. We pray for families who are missing loved ones, for those who have who grieved the loss of loved ones, for those who have lost their houses and, and all the material possessions. And we pray for those relief workers. Would you, would you provide? Would you get the food and water where it needs to go? Would you please restore power? And um, would you bless those hurting people? Would I pray that the church would shine the light of Jesus in, in those areas where people need help the most. And Lord, we pray that you would do an amazing work, that the 101 hostages would be released, and that the, uh, the, the cruel leaders of that Hamas organization would be taken uh, away from leadership. We, we also pray for the Palestinians who suffer, and we pray that you would... Um, that you would help them as well. We pray for Christians in that region, and we pray that you would protect uh, the Jewish people. And Lord, as, as we come to your word, what a privilege it is to come to your word. We pray that you would move in our hearts, Holy Spirit, come and fill us. And as we talk about the gifts that you give to each one of us, please give us understanding, and please guide us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we're looking at Romans 12. First, look at your scripture if you would pull it out. And uh, before I get to Romans 12, I want to tell you about Romans 1 through 11 very quickly. It is, in my opinion, the most powerful theological exposition of the gospel that has ever been written. And it begins with, though we were made to know God, we do not want to know God. We want to worship created things. Though we look out into, you know, look out the windows. Look at the beauty of the world. We know it's not an accident. And, and look inside you in your conscience. You know right and wrong. You know that you, you know what's right and you don't do what's right. Not in the same way. And so those two things are clues about God. But we don't, we don't want to hear that. And so we end up worshiping created things. And you know what Romans 1 says? It says that we do all kinds of bad stuff. We're, we're gossip. We're greedy. We disobey our parents. Some of you kids disobey our parents. That's a representation of our lostness. And we don't like the way that God has created things. And one example of this isn't the ultimate example or the consummate example, but it is an example that we can just be clear on. In Romans chapter 1, it says that those who reject um, heterosexuality and they are attracted to those of the same sex, they are 
rebelling against the way that God created us that is so obvious anatomically as we're created male and female. And that's just an example. As in gossiping and being greedy and being disrespectful to our parents and being prideful and vain, all of those are a composite of our great, tremendous problem. He goes on, he says it's a Gentile problem. The Gentiles, they don't have the law, and so they, they do all kinds of weird things. And then he says, but wait a minute, Jews, it's a problem for you too. You have the law, you just don't listen to the law. And then he says, there's no one who is righteous, not even one. And from there, there's this amazing transition. There's a guy named Abraham, and he lived by faith. And there was a covenant made between God and Abraham. God made the covenant. And he said that you are going, your family is going to be a blessing to the whole earth. And then what's the fulfillment of that blessing to the whole earth? It's the one who came in the line of Abraham. It's Jesus. Because Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, what happened? Christ died for us. And though, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Is that good news? Can I get an amen? That's the good news of the gospel. Romans 7, Paul talks about how we're sinners anyway, and we struggle with sin, and, and geez, I'm so, he gets so mad at himself, and what should I do? Who's going to save me from this body of death? And then you know what he says? There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus in Romans 8. No condemnation in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven our sins. And then he talks about these glorious promises that Jesus will never leave us or forsake us, that, that uh, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then Romans 9 is this amazing chapter. It's, it's, it's hard, but it's amazing. It says that you were predestined. If you have faith in Christ, it's because God gave you that faith, not because you figured it out. You were predestined. And certainly that raises all kinds of questions, right? Like, what about those who aren't? And he, 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 uh, he probes around the mystery and then says it's a mystery. And who are you to talk back to God? This is the way that his mysterious will is carried out. And then he says, but we know that people are, are elect. And so what do we do? Romans 10. We've got to preach the gospel. We've got to tell them. I mean, how are they going to know unless, unless we tell them? And then he goes into Romans chapter 11 where he says that there is going to be a time where the Jewish people will um, not all, but a massive outpouring of the Spirit that will convert Jews. And oh, the riches and the mystery and the wonder of this great God. That's Romans 1 through 11. Okay? Pretty awesome. And then he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, and that is the word for brothers and sisters. Therefore, if all this is true, therefore, it says, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living sacrifice. That's irony for Paul, because sacrifices die. Sacrifices get their throats cut, animals, and they bleed, and that's, you know, given up to God. You and I are given up to God. And it isn't because we're trying to earn God's love or His favor. It is out of grateful response. All that God has done for us. Christian, know this. You're not behaving so that God loves you. God loves you, and so you, you behave in a Christ-like way out of a grateful response. That's what you and I are called and commanded to do. Living sacrifice. That's our whole lives. We ought to be willing. We ought to hold everything that we have with an open hand and to be willing to lay it down should we be called to lay it down. Holy and pleasing, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, this is hard to do. Sometimes we get confused, but what does Paul say? Don't be conformed to the world. It's easy to be conformed to the world. There's a lot of bad ideas out there, a lot of bad ideologies, aren't there? There's, there's ideas that everyone should have equal amount of everything. And that's a bad idea, because it'll never happen. That doesn't even happen in heaven. There are like different rewards for different people who are faithful. Like that, that's pretty amazing. And, and it's also a bad idea, because the Bible doesn't say anything like that. It says we should be generous. It doesn't say everyone should have the same amount. That's a bad idea. Another bad idea is that money is going to make you happy and fulfilled. That's a bad idea. It's not true. There's another one. That if you are beautiful or successful 
or uh, famous, then you're going to be fulfilled. And that's also, those are bad ideas. There, there are bad ideas all over the place. There's a bad idea that if you, born a male, you can be a female, or vice versa. That's just a bad idea. We shouldn't give any quarter for it, because it hurts the people who are, who, who are moving in that direction. It's a bad idea. There are all kinds of bad ideas. How do we know the good ideas from the bad ideas? Only from the Word of God. And that's why it says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And Christians, you and I need to be renewed every bit as much as anybody else. Because those, some of those bad ideas that I mentioned, we, are, we easily fall prey to them. So, so we are transformed by the renewal of our mind as we study the Word of God. And then it says that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, do we know the, God, the, the will of God with 100% accuracy as to what school I should go to, who exactly I should marry, how many kids I should have, where I should live now, what job I should have, when I should retire, where I should retire? No, no. But do we know the will of God by reading the Word of God so that we know uh, I should stay married? Because, yeah, I, you know, don't, like, oh, if I just had found the soulmate, then I'd be okay. Are you married? You found your soulmate, okay? And you're stuck with each other. So rejoice in that, because that's just, that's your soulmate. Or, you know, are you wondering, like, should I work or not work and, and support my family or not? Well, the Bible's really clear. Support your family. Work. And, and should I, should I uh, develop what God has given me and use it, or should I just kick back and watch Netflix? You should develop what you have and, and work hard. Now, that doesn't mean you can't ever watch Netflix. But be careful what you watch. There's a lot of bad stuff out there. So, um, sidebar. So, we know the will of God. We know it enough to be obedient to God and to know how to be obedient to Him, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then Paul says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Okay? That's his second point. We live in grateful response. Point one. Point two is don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. Um, but think with sober judgment. What this means is just simply, you know how, like, I caught myself just this morning uh, being very judgmental of someone, and then I, like, the Spirit exposed it to me, and I repented. And we can be judgmental of other people, right? But the most judgmental we should be is when we look in the mirror, like, to, to assess ourselves with sober judgment. Uh, others, we should be... You know, God is, is judge. We, we know right from wrong, and we can say what's right and wrong. There's nothing wrong with judging in that way, but we ought to look at ourselves with sober judgment. So, now, uh, what, what Paul doesn't say, but what I do want to say, because I find this to be true in the life of the church, is there's some people who don't think they have anything to offer. So, you should not think so lowly of yourself or the Holy Spirit that you have nothing to offer. So, if your problem is exceeding pride... Then, then, you know, don't think so highly. If your problem is exceeding groveling and I got nothing to offer and I'm so I wish I, then don't think too lowly of yourself. And then he says, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. We've been assigned different measures. And do you know people who you are like, man, they are so faithful. I wish I could be like them. Well, aspire to be like them, but know that you aren't them and God has made you the way that you are and he's, he's made you fearfully and wonderfully. Goes on. So in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ. This is a, a wonderful analogy that Paul loves to use, and he uses it in several places. And um, what, what he's going to say is similar in Romans as it is in First Corinthians 12. This image, this metaphor of us as brothers and sisters, as a body with different. Um, we, we bring different things to the body. We might be a finger or a foot or a toe or the heart or the liver or whatever, but we all bring different things to the body. And, and we all are given, look, look in First Corinthians, just as the body is one, has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one, so it is with Christ, for in one spirit, we're baptized in one body, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. So it's the spirit who gives us these gifts. And notice, that what this should do for our unity. Like, 
if you have a problem with a brother or sister in Christ who's part of this body, you've got to go to them. Because we're now that doesn't mean you have to be best friends with everybody. It doesn't mean that every problem is going to be resolved perfectly. But it does mean that we are accountable to one another to be to be um, to be able to resolve our differences. And I mean, look at what he what he says in verse thirteen. We're all baptized into one body, and then he uses four of the most disparate categories you could ever come up with: Jew, Gentile. They didn't. I mean, they normally didn't like each other a whole lot, and they're one body. Slave and free, those are different categories, not according to being made in the image of God, but in that society, very different categories. They're one. And so the body is to be unified. And then he goes on in, in 14 and following to talk about these different parts of the body. And then back in Romans 12, Paul says that um, though many in one body, individually members of it, verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us. So, I want to talk about what is a spiritual gift and what is its purpose. I used Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. It's a great book. I recommend it. And in that book, he has a very clear definition that I want to share with you. A spiritual gift is any ability empowered by the Holy Spirit to build up the church. Those three things. Any ability. He might have. And it's empowered by the Spirit. You can't have a spiritual gift if you're not a Christian. You might have a talent, or a like. You might be able to dunk a basketball. Actually, I don't know if anyone in this room can dunk a basketball. You might be you might be able to run really fast. You might be able to get a um, great score on your your ACT. You might be really good with spreadsheets. That's a talent you still should use. That's not exactly the same thing as a spiritual gift. It's empowered by the Spirit, and the purpose of it is to build up the church. It is so that the church benefits from what God has given to you so that as you respond in gratitude to what God has given you, you use the gift to build up the church. Of course, we know the purpose is not to shine. It's not to let people know how great I am. It's not to be more valuable to God. Of course, it's not any of that. It is to build up the body of Christ. And in another body passage, metaphor, Paul says that rather than being tossed by every wind of doctrine that comes along, every new idea that comes along, rather than that, seeking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. And in the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, and each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Isn't that a beautiful passage that the, the gifts that, that, that we use them to build ourselves up in love? Love of Jesus and love for one another. So again, I want to go back and just, just if you are wondering, this is a great definition, any ability empowered by the Spirit to build up the church. So then what are the specific spiritual gifts? One of the passages that, that in this morning's reading, that Pastor Ken read, has some of the gifts. But I'm going to just going to list all the gifts as they are uh, revealed to us in the New Testament, and then I'm going to talk about them a little bit, and then we're going to come back to them because um, there are going to be questions that I hope to get to in two weeks. So, First Corinthians 12, 8 through 10 has gifts that are list: utterance of wisdom and knowledge, utterance, speaking gifts, wisdom, knowledge, faith. Gift of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Whoa. Well, some of those are, you know, they're, that's, um, some of those are a little bit different than handing out bulletins on Sunday morning, right? So there's, there's one list. Here's another one. Apostle, prophet, teacher, miracle. I love this. Miracles, healing, helping, administrating, tongues. So, you know, helping, it's, not, it's just not that sexy a gift, right? But right next to it is healing. So I say this to point out that Paul does not say, well, here are the mundane gifts, and then let me tell you about the super awesome, esoteric, secret gift. It's not what he does. He lists them all together in the same passage. And then Ephesians 4.11, apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. Those are kind of leadership, eldership, gifts that, that Paul lists in Ephesians 
chapter 4, um, and, and that some of these, uh, my interpretation, one of these in particular is an office, not an ongoing gift in the narrow sense, and, and I'll get to that in a couple weeks. First Peter 4.11, whoever speaks, that covers all kinds of speech gifts that we've seen before. Whoever serves, that covers several gifts as well. And then finally, our passage this morning, prophecy, serving, teaching, exhorting, contributing, or giving, leadership, mercy. So there's a whole lot of them. And I don't think Paul was listing every single one exhaustively, actually, because he doesn't do it in a way that's completely systematic. It's like he is speaking about several of them without including all of them in any list, and there, I think there are probably more than even what he lists. Another thing to note is that some of these gifts, like we all have a portion of some of them and are commanded to use some of them. So, like faith, um, in one of these lists, not in this one, but this one, uh, back here, nope, all the way to the beginning, faith. Well, we all have faith in Christ. If you're a Christian, you have faith in Christ. But there's some people who just have an incredible measure of faith. That's the spiritual gift of faith. And then I'll go back to Romans. Um, serving. You can't say, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of serving, so, honey, you're doing the dishes. Like, we're all commanded to serve, right? Same thing with giving. Um, after the series on the Holy Spirit, we're going to have a stewardship series, and you can't say, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of giving, so I'm not going to give. Like, that's not how it works. We're all called to give. But some people just are amazingly generous, and they have the gift of giving. Does that make sense? So there, there are some things that we all have. There are some things that the Spirit pours himself out and gives a particular um, gift in that regard. And I want to again point out that the so-called miraculous gifts are not set aside as different or in some way in a different category. They're all mentioned together. And so, in two weeks, I'm going to talk about those miraculous spiritual gifts. Are they still around or are they not? I'm going to talk about that in a couple weeks. But my point is this morning that you actually have a gift. And you have a gift to use. And some of these are, are at work in our church right now, and others need to be. You need to use your gift. Now, I'm very encouraged, and I just want to tell you how, how, how much of a blessing it is to lead this church. Because, you know, we just had lived the mission a month ago or so, and, and over 100 people signed up to serve in various ministries internally and externally. And that just, man, that just blesses my soul. And that's what the body should be doing, using gifts to, to serve and to use what God has given you to, to, um, to then build up the body of Christ. And I think, ultimately, this, this should be very practical for all of us. Uh, you may not know exactly what your gift is. So how can you know and how can you use your gift? Well, very, very practical. You can, first of all, pray. And you can ask God to reveal to you what your gift is. If you call this church your home, then there, ought, there is a way that God wants to use you within the church. That's, just, that's the truth. And if you're not doing anything now, we want you to. Okay? So pray about what the Lord has given you that you might use it. Another um, thing that you can do very practically is just ask. There are people who know you, who love you. And you can just say, what, what do you think? What do you think I would be good at? How, where do you think I could serve? Come ask me. Or, you know, ask the people who know you better, who, who you, can, you can talk to and ask. And then, here's the last thing. Do something. Anything. But trial and error is often the way that God brings us to an understanding of what our gift is and how we can use it the best. And I've seen this happen in so many ways. We have people who are just incredible at um, connecting in relationships and building relationships with people who are either in other countries or in uh, another part of our city, and they're using it, and it's just it's beautiful to see. Uh, every Wednesday at church, 
there's three women who come and they um, they cook the food together that somebody else brings down to Linden to feed high school kids through FCA, through the ministry of FCA and NACC. And they're, they're new to it. And they just jumped in. Now, did, did they, you know, was it a divine tete-a-tete with, you know, the Holy One of Israel who, you know, shouted down to them, go and cook pasta? No, it was not. It was, they tried it. They just, they gave it a shot. There are high school girls who have decided that they want to teach children's ministry. And that's awesome. There are some who are teaching youth ministry. There are others who, you know, they're getting their toe wet and they're they're greeting or they're helping out with the coffee. And I'm not saying that that is like the consummate expression of your gift. But what I am saying is that it's really important that you try and that you just do something because you have a gift to offer. And if you are later in your life, you know, and, and this is not a season where you can be tremendously active. And then we can pray. And we have, we have people who are prayer warriors who are on their knees proverbially or literally, and they're praying and praying. And praise God for that. That is a way to use your gift to serve. So if you're not able to be as active as, as you want to be, you, you, can still, you can still do that. But, but the bottom line is um, you and I are called to use our gifts, and uh, we don't have to be perfect, and we don't have to have, like, not everybody has the same gift, not everybody has the same measure. I think sometimes we are held back because we don't think we have enough, and we look around and somebody else is so much better at, you know, greeting people, or so much better at using their leadership gift, and gosh, I just wish I had that. You know, First Corinthians 12 also tells us that the Spirit gives the gift, and that we don't get to choose how much of it we get. I'm just not going to uh, preach like Charles Spurgeon anytime soon. And you're just going to have to live with it. Because, you know, it's just, I'm not going to write like Augustine or Calvin. I just, it's not going to happen. And uh, you may not have the gift that you want to have, but you do have a gift to develop it and use it that the body of Christ might be built up. Because the Spirit has poured out gifts on every one of us who claims the name of Christ. Can we use those together? Can I get an amen? Great. Okay. Father, we are so grateful that you call us out of death and into life, and then you call us to be useful, which is just the, the most joyful thing when you can use us to bring about your eternal purposes. So I pray that all of us would um, not worry about what we lack, but that we would just use what you what you have given to us so that we would build the body of Christ up, that you might be glorified and that we might love one another and that more people might be introduced to the great gospel of Jesus, receive the great news of Jesus, become followers of yours and use their gifts so that you get more glory. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you go, know that Jesus loves you. The Spirit has empowered us to serve in the ways that He calls us to. So go and do it. Please lift up your hands and receive this benediction blessing. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.